Welcome, and in this video course, we are looking at the CyberOps Associate version one course. This course is going to cover the skills and knowledge needed for successfully handling the tasks and duties, responsibilities of an associate level security analyst working at a security operations center. The goal of this video series is to help prepare learners for the Cisco 200-201 certification. That's focusing on understanding the Cisco Cybersecurity Operation Fundamentals course, known as CBROPS. Module 16, Attacking the Foundation. Here we're looking at IP PDU details. We're gonna look at IP vulnerabilities, and then we're gonna look at both TCP and UDP vulnerabilities to explain kind of how we can exploit them. So let's go ahead and jump right on in. IP PDU details. First of all, we already know that IPv comes in two main flavors, IPv4 and IPv6. IP itself is a layer three connectionless protocol, meaning it's there is no guaranteed delivery, it's more of a best effort, but it also means it's media independent. It provides the necessary function to deliver packets between the source and destination over any type of interconnected system. Again, no effort for valid uh, validation. So whether the source or destination is actually there, it doesn't matter. So threat actors can tamper with other fields in the IP header to carry out specific types of attacks. So it's an important for as an analyst position for us to understand the difference between IPv4 and IPv6 fields inside the header. So that means we have to look at the headers. So here's an IPv4 header. We have a version, we have a header length, we have a differential services, the DS, whether it's DSCP or ECN. We have a total length, not just a header length. We have identification, we have other flags, other offsets. We have a TTL, we have a protocol. Protocol should be of the data above it, so whatever layer four data we have. No, I take that back. Protocol is going to be the protocol that we're dealing with in this section. We have a header checksum, source and destination addresses, and below that will be the data. Keep in mind, as we look at this, the header is about 20 bytes long. Source and destination are going to be 32 bits each. There are 10 main fields in this area. So again, we version, DS, DSCP, ECN, TTL, protocol, source, destination. Those are the big ones that we need to understand. So version is a four bit binary number and that will determine what layer three version we're dealing with. Are we dealing with IPv4, or IPv6? It's a four bit binary number, 0100 identifies the data packet as a IPv4 data packet. The header length is a four bit field containing the total length of the IP header, normally about 20 bytes. The differential services or this serve are formally called the types of service fields. And this is eight bit fields used to determine the priority of each packet. When we're dealing with QoS or we're dealing with weighted uh, routing, this is where we're going to get a lot of those details. The six most significant bits of the diff serve fields are called the differentiated service codes, DSCP. The remaining two bits are the explicit congestion notification, ECN bits. Total length will be the entire length of the packet, including the header. Again, the maximum size of an IP packet is 65,535 bytes. Again, total length is about two bytes total. Identification flags and fragment offsets. These are going to be anything that moves packets. It might need to come across a route that cannot handle the size of the packet. So the packet might be divided or fragmented. This is what will actually identify those areas. 
TTL is a 8-bit binary value that is used to limit the lifetime or the life of a packet. That way it doesn't live forever. Basically between each layer 3 network it will actually decrement or decrease the TTL by 1. When the router receives a packet with a TTL of 1 it actually will discard it because as it decrements it to 0 that will kill that packet. If the TTL uh, again is 0 it will be discarded. Protocol. This is going to be used to identify the next layer protocol. So I was right. I just I always get the protocol portion. I always start saying it's layer 4 and then I say no it's layer 3. But protocol is the layer 4 protocol. Is it ICMP? Is it TCP or UDP? Common values are going to be the decimal numbers 1, 6, and 17 respectively. So if we see a decimal number 1 in the protocol, we know that that is going to be ICMP. That allows us to look at the data, the layer 4 segment or data frame, that is sitting in the data so we can analyze where it's going to be going. Header checksum is again a checksum source and destination is a 32-bit binary value of the IP4 address and lastly is the options and padding. This is a field that will varies in length between 0 up to uh, 32 bits. If the option values are not multiple of 32 bits, zeros are added to the padding to ensure that this field contains a multiple of 32 bits. Basically making sure that it's all nice and rounded numbers. I've already done videos on reviewing IPv4 header details in Wireshark. If you need a link to the video, please let me know. I will be glad to give you that information. So now that we looked at an IPv4 header, let's look at an IPv6 header. IPv6 header, you'll know this is way more simplified. It has version, traffic class, flow labels, payload length, next header, hop limit, and source and destination address. But you'll also notice it's double the size. It's less complex, but larger. That's because IPv6 addresses are 128 bits so we have a source and destination. We have two 128-bit addresses. So that takes up the majority of the space. Version is again by the 4-bit binary value. It's set to 0110. That will identify IPv6. Traffic class is again very similar to the differentiation service for IPv4. Still 8 bits. Flow label is new. This is a 20-bit field suggests that all packets with the same flow label receive the same type of handling by the router. So you can actually start manipulating the flow so that the Layer 3 device will handle it slightly different. Payload length is a 16-bit field that will indicate the length of the data portion or the payload of the IPv6 packets. So again, payload length is just the payload. We don't have a header length, we don't have a total packet length anymore, we just have the header and then we have a payload length. Next header is an 8-bit field which is equivalent to the IPv4 protocol field. It will indicate the data payload that the packet is carrying. Again, ICMP, TCP, or UDP. It got rid of the TTL, however, it's just kind of changed it to hop limit. It's still an 8-bit fill replacing the TTL and again it's decremented by 1 so when the counter reaches 0 the packet is discarded and an ICMP v6 time exceeds message will be forwarded to the original source. Again we have the source and destination addresses both IPv6 addresses so both are 128-bit addresses. IPv6 does have a few things where IPv4 does not. IPv6 has an extension header, an EH, that provides optional network layer information. The extension header are optional and are placed between the IPv6 header and the payload. This is normally used for fragmentation, security, mobility, 
and future use. We have a video looking at IPv6 headers in Wireshark. Again, I've already done these videos. I've posted them. So if you need links to them, please reach out. I will give you links to them. So moving on, let's talk about IP vulnerabilities. So common vulnerabilities are going to be things like ICMP attacks, DDoS attacks, DOS attacks, spoofing, man in the middle, and session hijacking. Interesting thing is I've done videos for all of these. So if you want to see them in real world application, let me know. I will show you what, uh, how to do them and kind of what they look like. ICMP attack, this is where a threat actor uses ICMP echo packets, ping, to discover subnets for generating DOS flood attacks. DOS attacks are when a threat actor attempts to prevent legitimate users from accessing a resource by disrupting that resource by using or consuming its resources. Essentially, we send tons of data to a machine and we should make that machine run to a crawl so that it's not able to be functioning. DDoS attacks, same thing. We distribute that attack so we, instead of having one machine doing it, we may have 20 machines doing it so that we can take down a target. Spoofing is where we spoof a source address in an attempt to perform some type of connection with a destination. We can pretend to be a legitimate source while we're trying to access resources. Man in the middle is just that. It's a man in the middle that will position themselves between source and destination, and it will try to control traffic between both source and destination to go through that device. Session hijacking is when a threat actor gains access to a physical network, and they're able to deploy a man in the middle attack to hijack sessions on a network. It is not always so much on a physical network. You can do session hijacking on the internet as well. It's just those are more limited. So let's go ahead and let's look at how we do these attacks a little bit more in detail. ICMP, while it was developed to carry diagnostic messages and report general errors, it can do much more than that. The ping command is a user-generated ICMP message called an echo request. This is used to verify connectivity between source and destination. So here we have a threat actor using ICMP for reconnaissance. Essentially, we can send an echo request, whether it be spoofed or not, to a victim. If we actually want the echo response, the reply to come back to us, we would not spoof our address. If we don't want the response to come back to us, we could spoof the address. So it really just depends on what the purpose that we're trying to accomplish. What is interesting is a basic DOS attack is sending out these request responses and we just keep sending more and more and more of them. The destination will be responding to them. The more we send, the more they respond. The less resources the destination will have. If we distribute this attack, we can have multiple attackers attacking one destination. And again, that just consumes those resources faster and faster. That makes it so that the destination, the victim in this case, isn't able to actually respond because they don't have enough freed resources. So networks should have a strict ICMP access, should and does or two, do two different things. The following tables will list the common messages of interest to threat actors. Echo request and reply. This is used for verification. Unreachable. This is basically performing network reconnaissance and scanning. Mask reply. This is where we're using uh, an address to map an internal network. Redirection. This is where we're using to lure a target host into sending all traffic through a compromised device, a spoofed default gateway, for example, so that we can create a man in the middle attack. Lastly, we have an ICMP router discovery. This is used to inject bogus routes into the routing table of a target host. This doesn't have to mean you're sending bogus routing tables or routing updates to a router. Each individual device, each computer, has a specific route table stored locally. Normally, the route table will have a default gateway that it will send everything, but you can inject bogus routes into that table, modifying the default gateway 
of that node or of that end device. I've already done videos on these areas, so again, if you need them, say something. So amplification and reflection attacks. Again, this is basically a way for distributing our attacks. The amplification is basically when the threat actors forwards ICMP echo request messages to many hosts. These messages contain the source IP address of a victim. That way, you have legitimate devices that are doing what they're supposed to be doing. They are responding to the ICMP echo request. However, the source that was put in those packets are of the victim. That way, you have all of these end nodes that are replying to this message that they think is legitimate. The reflection basically is these hosts will all reply to the spoofed IP address of the victim and overwhelming it. Again, this is a version of the uh, distributed denial of service. It's just instead of having multiple machines act, do this on purpose, they are being done uh, by accident. And again, that means by accident, the attacker, the threat actor, is causing the legitimate destination machines to respond to a spoofed address. The, le the legitimate machines don't know that they are responding to a spoofed ICMP message. So they're un kind of unaware. They're not so much infected or part of a botnet or things of that nature. It's just they are responding to an ICMP message. Newer forms of application and reflection attacks, focusing on things like NTP or DNS, are definitely growing and are being used more successfully. We have address spoofing attacks, and this is where we spoof addresses. Whether it be an IP address or a MAC address, a threat actor can create packets and frames with faulty source addressing, again, IP or MAC addresses. This will either hide the identity of the original sender, the threat actor, or to pose as a legitimate user to gain access to a network. The threat actor can then gain access to otherwise inaccessible data. If there's an ACL that says, deny everyone outside the network to access to this server, if you're able to spoof your address to mimic one that is allowed on the network, then you bypass security. Spoofing is usually incorporated into other forms of attacks, such as a smurf attack. Spoofing attacks can be one of two types, non-blind or blind. Non-blind is when the threat actor can see the traffic that is being sent between host and the target. The threat actor will use a non-blind spoof to inspect and reply packets from the target victim. Non-blind spoofing determines the state of the security appliances and it also allows for the sequence number predictions. This is where hijacking the authorized sessions can come into play because it knows certain details of the packets. A blind spoof is when the actor cannot see the traffic being sent between the host and the target. So the blind spoof is used typically in DOS attacks or DDoS attacks. Address spoofing can also be when we uh, alter MAC addresses. So we can manipulate switches to have the incorrect data in their CAM table. So the switch will overwrite the current CAM table and will insert the new assigned MAC. That way we can forward traffic to the spoofed MAC address of the threat actor. This is actually how man in the middle attacks normally happen. You can spoof the MAC address of the default gateway. That way, everyone that is sending data or a specific target would then send all that data to the man in the middle, the threat actor or the attacker machine. That attacker machine will analyze and forward traffic as appropriate. It may cause a slight delay, but that way the threat actor, the attacking machine, will actually consist of all of that content. All right, so now that we talked about IP, let's go ahead and jump in layer four. Let's look at layer four vulnerabilities, specifically 
TCP and UDP vulnerabilities. TCP and UDP are going to be the main focus. ICMP as a layer 4 technology was kind of already discussed. However, we didn't really look at the ICMP header. That is normally saved for both TCP and UDP. Any type of layer 2, 3, 4 are going to have their own sets of headers. Here we're looking at a TCP segment header and you will see that when we're looking at control bits there are six bits there. Those bits will identify what type of message it is. Is it urgent? Is it an acknowledgement? Is it a push function, a reset function, a synchronous sequence number or sync function or is it a fin, no more data, the vSending function. You'll also notice that it will have source and destination ports. Because this is TCP, we'll have a sequence number and an acknowledgement number. There's other things here as well, but that's outside the scope of what we need to talk about. Here we're looking at specifically the control bits. Reliability delivery, TCP again incorporates acknowledgement as it's connection oriented. So that means guaranteed delivery is there. So instead of relying on the upper layer protocols to detect and resolve these errors, it can actually look at the sending of content, the sending of data, and it will attach an acknowledgement number. If the acknowledgement number is not received, the sender will retransmit that data. It will require an acknowledgement for the data received. If it doesn't receive it a second time, it will retransmit again. Examples of application protocols that make use of TCP are things like TCP or uh, protocols that make use of TCP will include protocols such as HTTP, SSL or TLS, FTP, DNS, specifically DNS zone transfers. Those are the big ones. There's more, but those are the big ones. Remember that when we're looking at protocols, when we're looking at port numbers, our port numbers can be tied to specific protocols. If we're talking UDP, UDP port 25 is different from TCP port 25. So keep that in mind. UDP connection oriented, UDP connection list oriented. Again, those should have already been discussed in earlier networking courses, but this is just again hitting home that TCP is connection oriented, UDP is connection list oriented. TCP also has the ability to handle flow control. And basically TCP will implement these controls to address uh, these issues uh, when we're sending data. Rather than acknowledging one segment at a time, we can actually multi uh, acknowledge multiple segments within a single acknowledgement. That's called a window size. If we want to assume we can send 10 packets we can, instead of having to okay each individual receipt of each packet, we can now have an acknowledgement for that group, that window size of 10 packets. TCP is stateful, meaning communication between two parties occurred during, a, uh, during an established session. That establishment happens with a three-way handshake. The handshake I will go over in just one second. At the end of that session, the communication will then be torn down with an additional final handshake that will close the connection. So how do we look at a three-way handshake? Well, first we will have a sender send a sync. They will have a sequence number and a control number. The receiver will receive the sync. It will look at the sequence number and we'll look at the acknowledgement number. The acknowledgement number will be 1 plus the sequence number that it received. Here we have the sender sending a sequence number of 100. The receiver will see the sequence number of 100, will add 1, and then we'll send that back as a sync ACK, synchronous acknowledgement. The original sender will receive the sync ACK will check its seek uh, number 
and it should have a seek number of 101. That will be the acknowledgement number that it received from the receiver. It will then take the new sequence number that the sender sent and we'll add one to that. So here the sender is going to be sending a sequence number of 100 so the new acknowledgement number will be 301, 300 plus 1. So actually I'm going to grab my pen. This number allows us to get that acknowledgement. The new sender will generate their own sequence number and that allows us to get that number. This guy right here will match the sequence number over here. That allows us to verify that we have an established session. This is the three steps for our through a handshake. So how do we attack it? Well, we can attack TCP at the handshake. We could be flooding sync requests. We could be sending specific uh, random garbage acknowledgement numbers. We can open these sessions and never actually do them. We can also then keep sending reset options. So a traditional attack looking at TCP is going to be a TCP sync flood. And this is an attack that will exploit the handshake. Here we again we see an attacker sending up the requests and they may have spoofed the source, uh, the source address. So the web server will receive the requests and they will actually start sending sync acts to complete its handshake to the wrong user. Here, since the attacker spoofed the address of a valid user, the valid user will be receiving all of these sync acknowledgements. However, the uh, valid user never actually initiated them, so there won't be a way for the server to actually establish that session. The target, the web server, the more that this occurs, will have uh, several half-open sessions that actually don't allow for additional users to connect. Again, resources are finite, so the more resources we consume on a web server, the less they have to actually serve legitimate users. We also have what's called a TCP reset attack. These are attacks that can be used to terminate a TCP communication between two hosts. Essentially, the threat actor could do a TCP reset attack by sending a spoofed packet containing a TCP RST bit to one or both of the devices, A or B. If they spoof the source address and they send it to the legitimate destination, either A or B, and they set the control bit to reset, this will terminate the communication. That is why understanding the flags are extremely important. When the TCP session is being torn down, it follows a four-way exchange. When the client has no more data to send, it will send a FIN flag. The server will send an acknowledgement. The sender will then also send their FIN. The destination, computer A, will send an acknowledgement sending of receipt of them receiving the computer B's fin flag. Both A and B will both send fin flags. Both A and B will both send acknowledgements after the receipt of the fin flag they were received. The client will then respond with an acknowledgement verifying that the connection is closed. This is because the initiating machine received a reset that actually then starts this process. We also have things like session hijacking. Session hijacking is another form of vulnerability and the threat actor takes over an already authenticated host as it communicates with its target. When we're looking at sessions between a host and a web server, for example, they have a session ID, they have a cookie. 
if you are able to gain the session ID or the cookie between the two, you can actually take over that session. However, most modern day web browsers and most modern day web uh, hosting machines no longer are susceptible to this type of an attack. However, that doesn't mean that they're not self susceptible. Just because new servers, new updates prevent this, doesn't mean that everyone have those new updates. And the sad fact is, there are web servers still running Windows Server 2000 or 2003, even though they've been end of life for years. Or unpatched or out of date web servers that still allow for the interception of session content, session IDs, and cookies, thus allowing these session hijackings to still occur. So now that we've looked at TCP, now it's time to dive into UDP and understand all of the vulnerabilities that are tied to UDP. First thing you're going to notice is definitely UDP has a much simplified header. You're going to have a source port, destination port, length, checksum, and data. That's it. You don't have acknowledgement. You don't have uh, control bits. UDP is very stripped down. Again, low overhead makes this very desirable, but that means things like error detection, error correction is not here. This is best effort. UDP is most commonly used with DNS, DHCP, uh, NFS, uh, and trivial FTP. These are used for real-time applications, voice, video, things that need no acknowledgments, things that need the fast response. UDP, like everything, is susceptible to attacks. So, UDP is not protected by any type of encryption. While encryption can be added to UDP, it's not available by default. Because again, simplified low overhead is what the goal here with this. So that lack of encryption means that anyone can see the traffic, change it, modify it, and then put it back on the network. One of the most common types of attack is a UDP flood attack. And here is when a UDP flood attack, all the resources on a network are consumed. UDP is uh, just continuously sent over the network to consume the resources of the network infrastructure, the switches, the routers, things like that. The threat actor must use a tool like UDP Unicorn or a low orbit uh, ion cannon. These are DDoS at uh, attack tools. These tools allow for the sending of UDP packets or the flooding of UDP packets, often from a spoofed host to uh, devices on the network. The program will sweep through all known ports trying to find closed ports. This will cause the server to reply with additional ICMP messages, most notably the unreachable message. This again generates more traffic. This also then generates additional resources because the end device is now having to process and send out these messages. So all of this is done to create tons of traffic, consuming all the bandwidth, making the network come to a crawl. And that is it for this chapter. In this uh, chapter, we looked at the different types of attacks, ICMP, DDoS, man in the middle, spoofing, hija uh, session hijacking. We looked at the headers for IPv4 versus IPv6, for UDP versus TCP. We looked at common TCP attacks and UDP based attacks. And that is it for this lecture. If you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.